route, and Randy Moss, without even really being able to run, as he shoots the moon to the pass, pumps to the left, eight seconds left, he gets away from the pressure, fires to the end zone, it's hot, it's Greg Lewis, go by Thomas, Greg Lewis' his first catch, has given the Minnesota... Four, three, two, one, zero. Gather yeah, around, Skull Brothers and Sisters. Welcome to Minnesota Sports Talk presents House Calls with Skull Doc. The doctor is in. What's up, man? How's it going? It's going great, man. I'm so excited. Finally get this going, get to talk Vikings with you on a much more routine basis. Let's go, man. Let's go. I'm, I'm happy, man. I, someone took the bait. Finally, I got someone to do a show, uh, you know, his own show on my channel. It's awesome, man. I'm glad that that way someone else is doing all the work. And I just sit here, sit here, no. and push buttons. That beautiful video you guys just saw, uh, House Calls. Dave put that together. He's a magician with this kind of stuff. I'm happy to come on, uh, spend an hour here and there, talk some Vikings, um, and, and just have fun. So let's talk some. Let's talk some Vikings, bro. Dude. Dude, uh, what, so what do you th- what do you what do you think of the news coming out of training camp so far, man? It's exciting. I mean, again, just keeping in mind that this year is about growth. Um, definitely not Super Bowl contenders this year, but what what we've seen just in a few days here uh, is just JJ McCarthy seeming to continue to progress and takes the step uh, taking the steps that he needs to take um, to become a better leader to run the offense. Uh, love what I'm seeing just from these training camp highlights that uh, apparently are getting fans in trouble for taking too many videos and putting them online. So hopefully we still get a, you it's know some year. yeah some video access there. Um, and then you know just excited to see them get in the pads uh, tomorrow. And and coming up we we're going to dive into the quarterback competition, but we had some off season issues uh, again this year. Um, unfortunately the, the worst of it was being, you know, Kyrie Jackson, um, losing his life in a apparent drunk driving accident. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I think he posted something on Twitter and I, and I replied CB one, that's how much I thought of him. Tell me what you, th- tell me how, how you took it when, when it came, when, when you heard the news. Oh, it's tragic. I mean, you read something like that, you get a, a feeling in your stomach that you can't shake and um it's it's unfortunate but everyone knows someone affected by drunk driving in this day and age there's no excuse for it um not that it it makes this situation you know any better at all but i mean him being the person that wasn't behind the wheel uh wasn't inebriated and to lose his life so young so much life ahead of him uh, I, I mean, it just stings just a little bit more. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's terrible, and and it can be completely avoided. You know, if you, if you drink, don't get behind the wheel. Um, there's Uber, there's Lyft, there's other ride services. It, and we were both Uber drivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I drove Uber um, <laughs> after residency and before I started practicing because I was uh, sitting at my house for two months, and my wife says, "Dude, do something." So I drove Uber and, um, you know, I met a lot of great people doing it. Yeah. And, uh, there's no excuse for that. And young man lost his life. Um, it could, it could, you know, it happens every day. Uh, and and it's, there's no excuse for it. And my heart goes out to his family. Uh, it was great to see all the steps the Vikings as an organization took to honor his memory and to help his family. And, um, and it's a beautiful memorial that they, they made at the practice, uh, facility as well to Kyrie. So rest in peace, Kyrie. And, you know, hopefully things like this continue to sit in the back of our minds as we go through our daily lives. And one more thing, uh, I mean, for anyone that has children out there, nothing good happens after midnight, especially around the holidays. 
make sure that your loved ones aren't driving on the roads if you know if it's not needed. Um, stay safe, stay home after midnight, and things like this can be avoided. Now, it was very short-lived before something else happened right after that. And, you know, unfortunately, two years in a row, Jordan Addison does something pretty silly. Last year, it was 140 miles an hour and, you know, saying that he was had a, a pet emergency to this year. Um, you know, the... You know, it's still out there, and he's he's doing all the he's saying all the right things based on what his lawyer tell him to say. Is that it sounds like he was asleep at the wheel, at on a off ramp or something like that. And you know, in how did you feel about his uh, interviews after the, after it happened? He said what he needed to say. He he seemed like he was truly sorry. He felt embarrassed. He talked about being in a dark place. Afterwards, he scrubbed his social media of all Vikings content because he was embarrassed. Um, I was listening to a lot of the beat reporters who follow this team, and they were all kind of uh, on the same boat in in wanting to hear Kevin O'Connell and Kwesi Adolfo Mensa kind of lay the hammer on him a little bit just to show that this will not be tolerated. KOC has a, uh, a stigma, if you will, that he's the ultimate player coach. The, the complete opposite of a Mike Zimmer. And, you know, there was some concern if you slap Jordan Addison's wrist, is this going to keep happening? Um, but Jordan Addison said the right things. I think that the biggest thing for me was that it happened literally a week after Kyrie's passing. I mean, read the room. This was your teammate. He lost his life. And, uh, and then, you know, we don't even know all the details with the story, but to be sleeping behind your, you know, the, the wheel on an exit ramp in LA, you know, the busiest highway in all of the country. Um, that's not okay. And first and foremost, uh, I'm just concerned about Jordan Addison's life going forward to make sure that he, uh, stays healthy and, and stays alive. Um, and then second most, he's just, he has to mature. He has to grow up and he has to realize that, um, life comes at you fast when you're 22 years old in the, the NFL and you got to put your big boy pants on and you, you can't do childish things that, you know, we all do at this age, but, uh, he's in the national football league and he's a national football player and he has to abide by those standards. And I saw something today that says that he may have a three game suspension. Uh, I don't know about that personally. I mean, usually they like to let the legal process play out first. And so I don't I don't know if that suspension comes this year or how that's going to go. But uh, either way, Jordan Addison said that he's going to accept any punishment proudly because he knows that he messed up. And, um, you know, I just hope you know, this is strike two for him. And uh, a lot of people believe that the Vikings have expressed to him, you know, if there won't be a strike three. If there's a strike three, you're gone. So hopefully he wakes up because he's a hell of a player. And I'd like to see him continue his career in a Vikings uniform. Yeah, and um, it, it was looking like a pretty good off season for him. You know, he said he 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 did have a plan when he went to the line last year, and he was getting jammed, and he uh he he, he did he just didn't have the footwork that he needed and the plan to come off the line last year. And he said he worked with the uh, you know, with the receivers coach, and you know we have a really good one, and the bright has a bright future. Uh, hopefully we can keep him for a while because this receiver core is ridiculous. Um, but it, it was really looking pretty good for him, and he's kind of showing out in camp too it, from videos I saw. How, how do you feel about the way he's progressed? Well, Jordan Addison, from the day he stepped on the field as a rookie, has impressed me as a football player. I was worried um, with his relative athletic score being what it was at his yeah. size. Typically, if you're – uh, that small, you need to be a hyper athlete at the position to really see have some success. But he showed us from year one that he was pretty damn good, even without Justin Jefferson. He was uh, competing and and getting some stats. And um, hell, he burned Jair Alexander for three hours before Kirk unfortunately tore his Achilles tendon that day at Lambeau. And yeah. um, so, and and I was really happy to hear those mature from a football standpoint those mature words that he had in regards to getting better uh at his craft 
And I think that as a wide receiver, it's incredibly important to win off the line of scrimmage. That what's that's what makes Devontae Adams one of the best wide receivers uh, during his time in the NFL. He's incredibly gifted off the line of scrimmage. And if you watch the receiver documentary on Netflix, Justin Jefferson says that you know he watches a ton of Adams film because he wants to you know be just as good off the line as well. So you know that's encouraging. Um, I think that. Jordan Addison can continue to thrive as the number two in this offense. And it will be exciting uh, once TJ Hawkinson gets up to speed and we get our full arsenal of weapons back. Now, sticking with the receivers, um, I was a big fan of this guy coming out of college when we drafted him just because I felt like he was, you know, he was going to have a thousand yard season and I think he broke his hand. It was Jalen Naylor. And I'm actually looking at the ESPN depth chart and they got him as wide receiver three. What do you think of him jumping up the depth chart and in actually getting to be wide receiver three, which where I was expecting him to be? Um, yeah. How do you feel about him? hundred percent there with you. So when he was drafted, my younger brother-in-law he is a huge michigan state fan so i any michigan state player i'll just go to him and i'll say tell me about this guy and he said fast as hell but constantly hurt and yeah. that's kind of been his story so far now as a doctor that's actually one of my, my biggest pet peeves um labeling people in the nfl as, as injury, injury prone. prone yeah i hate it um there are certain injuries that are more prone to recurrence and getting re-injured um but like Let's just here, for example, Marcus Davenport came over here last year and he gets hurt and everyone said, I knew it, right? This guy's injury prone. And he starts off the lines on the PUP, right? And people are saying, I knew it. This guy's injury prone. But he had issues with his shoulder when he was in New Orleans. And then he had a high ankle sprain with the Vikings last year. That's just bad luck, man. It's the NFL. People get hurt. I I, I don't necessarily. Now, now I, I think that nutrition plays a big part in NFL players in, in regards to recovery and things like that, but people are going to get hurt in the NFL. And I think that some people are lucky in the sense that they don't get hurt as often. And some people are unlucky, unlucky in the sense that they get hurt more often. So when it comes to Jalen Naylor and, and other NFL players who are hurt uh, for one or two seasons in a row, they typically say that you're hurt until you're not hurt. And look at Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel has a, long history of injury. And then all of a sudden he had two seasons in a row where, you know, he didn't miss a game and he was rocking it out. Um, so in the NFL, I guess you're injury prone until you're not injury prone. So I really hope that this kid can stay on the field and show what he can do. Uh, this latest practice we saw, he scored three touchdowns in the red zone drill. Um, beautiful, beautiful catch. Yeah. In the corner end zone. Good concentration catches, getting the feet down. Uh, and he's fast. So I would love to see, a guy like that, especially on the dagger concept where he can clear out the field and you can get JJ running in the, the open field behind him. Um, I think that J or Jalen Naylor has a much higher ceiling to his game than Powell, who is oh, yeah. a great little possession receiver, crafty veteran, but doesn't offer anything in the run game. And Jalen may not either, but what I do you mean? That, the touch push? He, he can't yeah. do the touch push <laughs> two times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it again. Yeah. Let's do it again. But, uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot. To, but let's talk about, before we go on to some other big news that happened in the offseason or, you know, in, during camp, uh, sticking with, you know, sticking on the other side of the ball with cornerback, where do you feel like we are with that? I know you I know you talked off the air about, uh, you know, maybe adding something to the cornerback room. Talk about that. It's got to be the thinnest room in the NFL, I would think, which is unfortunate, but that's just where the Vikings are right now. A um, lot of dead cap with this team, and it, it is a rebuilding year. And um, I was okay with where they were coming into the year in terms of, hey, let's see what these kids got. Let's let the chips fall where they may and then make some decisions next offseason. Uh, Makai Blackman was, in my opinion, the most promising guy in that room, and I really wanted to see what he could do this year PFF loves his game. He did not miss a tackle last year. Uh, he's very sticky in man and zone coverages. Uh, he got hit a couple times with some jump balls last year. He's a shorter guy, but that's going to happen. Uh, but I was really excited to see what he was going to do. I was excited to see what Byron Murphy could do in the slot 
how they want him to play more in the slot where that's his natural position. Yeah. And, um, and then sh- with uh, Shaq Griffin coming in, it seemed like he was actually playing pretty well, albeit without pads so far. But And then he sprained his ankle, I believe. So he's got a soft tissue injury. We'll see him back in a week, hopefully. Um, but right now we're sitting at Booth Jr. playing on the outside, Duke Shelley playing on the outside that they just brought back. And I truly don't believe that Flores is enamored with him as a player in his scheme because they did not bring him back last year. But mm-hmm. right now they just need bodies. Um so right now it's I think it's a strong indication that they want to add somebody that seems like Kevin O'Connell's um, his speech. What he we talked about trying to have a competitive camp with enough bodies in that room. I do think they're going to go after a veteran. I'm hoping it's Stefan Gilmore. I think he's got one more year in him. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Where are you at? I mean, I could see them adding a body. Um you know, we have what 19 million in cap room left, and uh, where would that be best served? Who will get cut out of camp? You know, who will get cut out, cut when the you know camp cuts start happening? Will there be a bigger pool of players? I'm, 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 I'm probably waiting. You know, I'm probably waiting to see what you know comes out. Maybe they're you know because we might need a couple of spots after camp happens. We we might not like some of these guys, but. Um, there was talk about Cameron Bynum. How true is that? Do you think that Cameron Bynum, who was drafted as a cornerback, uh, or he was a cornerback in college? What do you think about him? Maybe dabbling in, uh, you know, playing a, you know, a, you know, nickel or or something like that. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think he could do it. I think he could come down and play nickel. Uh, I don't think that they're going to want him to do that. I think they showed last year that um, they had other guys to fill that role. Um, Sorry, his his name's – I'm blanking right now, but who's the safety that just broke out last year and was playing a lot of nickel for us? He's going to be in the box a lot this year too. 44. Josh Metellus. They actually gave him his own position. Yeah, Metellus. I don't even know what the – what does the MB stand for? Nickelback, Nickelback, he's Nickelback. Yeah, uh, <laughs> unanimously hated by everybody, but platinum record Nickelback yeah. here and or there. But anyways, oh so yeah, they have list them. They ESPN added a position Nickelback. So there you go. Yeah, so I don't think personally that Cam Bynum's going to find himself in the box. I think he's a perfect free safety yeah, type. He, I agree. He's very good in zone coverage as the last. And line he's not. Defense. I thought he was short, but he's six foot. You know, he's not. He's he's. You know, decent. You know, he's normal height, so, so that's pretty good. Not a very thick guy, though. Either I think Metellus is better suited for that, and Harrison Smith yeah. too can play down there as well. So I think they like him in the back end. And it really looked like you know we were going to have a little more depth with uh you know until you know Blackman and we lost Kyrie Jackson. Uh, that you know where was Metellus going to play? You know, it maybe maybe early downs at nickel. I don't know what what we were going to do there but now um there was the biggest news that had everybody just waiting and waiting we couldn't get it done last year but justin jefferson signs the biggest non-quarterback contract to date um i i don't know was it 33 million was it 333 average value yeah right around there and uh, well deserved. Uh, congratulations to Justin Jefferson. Congratulations to the Vikings for getting this done. Thank God we are not in a situation right now like CD Lamb and Jamar Chase, where those guys are not practicing into training camp. And um, it just feels good to know that you got this guy locked up through 2029, which takes you through JJ McCarthy's rookie contract. So I love um, the offensive pieces that the Vikings have right now under contract for the foreseeable future. And it just takes a lot of weight off your shoulders going into the next offseason. Um, but you, you know you don't have to deal with this potential headache. And um, with the history of the Vikings and us fans, as Minnesota Vikings fans, we just have so much PTSD with losing great wide receivers in the past. Randy Moss traded away. Percy Harvin traded away. Um, it feels good to know that the superstar is not going anywhere. Exactly, Stephon Diggs. So... Uh, but, great signing, and, and I, he's worth every penny. But unlike, uh, you know, when we trade away Moss and end up with Williamson, we 
we ended up with uh you know Justin Jefferson when we lost Diggs. So that that worked out. Yeah, sometimes you play the lottery and you win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. Um, so I think I think uh well hey, and just recently uh, I guess the NFL Network posted the top thirty two uh, wide receiver cores, you know, listed by team. And we were ranked number one with all with all our wide receivers. And that was pretty much a no brainer. We all kind of expect that just based on the Hall of Famers and future Hall of Famers. And honestly, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Anthony Carter back in the day before your time, uh, he was my, you know, he was my favorite player to watch, you know, when I was nine, 10 years old. And then Ahmad Rashad, I wore number 28 because of him and, you know, just we had really great, Sammy White, even though they didn't even mention Sammy White, but they mentioned a couple other guys. Uh, but, you know, Diggs, Thielen, Percy Harvin, and then you got, you know, Chris Carter. Oh, Reed was mentioned. Uh, Chris Carter, Justin Jefferson, and uh, Randy Moss obviously would be the, the big three. But, yeah, you know, having this receiver core again being just you're just being that good again, which we missed during the – Adrian Peterson era. I mean, we had, we had like a, a snippets there and Percy Harvin a little bit, but you know, to have the receiver core we have now is just something glorious to watch, I think. And then throw in the TJ Hawkinson. Yeah. And it's incredibly important. The wide receiver outside of quarterback and yeah, even more so than offensive tackle. I think wide receiver drives the offense in terms of winning. They, mm-hmm. they, just matter so much to the game today with the way that the rules are played and you need three of them realistically you need at least three of them in an offense nowadays to make it easier on your quarterback Uh, because defenses if it was just Jefferson defenses are going to roll double triple coverage his way and you got to find a way to beat him now there was a another big guy getting signed recently and 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 I we didn't. We honestly probably thought maybe he'd wait till next year. Or the Vikings will wait till next year. Maybe he'd uh, have a Pro Bowl, his first Pro Bowl year, maybe all pro, where he'd break the bank against us. But honestly, we got a very good team-friendly deal with Christian Darisaw. Here's the he's dabbing up, you know, Chris Carter here. But uh, what do you think of that signing? How 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 well did that work out for us? Oh, it's fantastic for both sides, honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christian Darisaw is a top three offensive tackle, in my opinion, in this league, uh, counting Trent Williams, and he's on his way out of the league anytime now. And um, Andrew Thomas is a great player for the New York Giants, and then right right up there with them is Christian Darisaw. Now, um, he does have to stay on the field. He's got a couple injuries here and there, but again, offensive linemen are going to get banged up, so I don't hold that against him. And I think he's, I think it was very smart for the Vikings to get this done early and get ahead of it so that they can save on the long run. Uh, And it was smart for Christian just to get it done for him. And, and in case he does have an injury this year, then, you know, his market isn't suppressed next year and they're going through this back and forth. I think it's very fair for both sides. It technically does make him the highest earning tackle from an average per year basis. Um, without being a four-year deal for $113 million. So super happy with this deal. Again, he's tied through the Minnesota Vikings now till 2029, so you can clearly see what Quasey's is doing here and tying this offensive unit together through the entire rookie contract of J.J. McCarthy. And then at that time, we'll, we'll have some decisions to make based on you know how, how it's looking. How is J.J. looking? Is it time to extend him, or is it time to find somebody else? Yeah, I think... Uh... I think he had to weigh the options and Rick and looking back at Rick Spielman, he was actually pretty good about this as trying to extend guys before their contract was up. And I, I heard him many times on, on the NFL radio while I'm out Ubering. <laughs> uh, he would, he would talk about how, you know, he would lay out the picture, you know, here's what, I mean, you may, you know, wait and you may make more money, but the, here's the risk. You know, and I think, I think Darisaw knowing that he's been hurt every year, um, well, his rookie year, he started out hurt. I mean, he ended up, you know, getting healthy and playing and starting and ultimately ended up being 
you know, he was rough to start with, but ended up being pretty good. And then after that, he's been great while healthy. So I think he really weighed the option and you're right. It was a, it was a good deal for both of us. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, having Brian O'Neill on the other side, still locked under contract here for a few more years. Yeah. It's exciting to see where this offense can go. And, um, biggest piece of the puzzle for this year is let's see what that left guard competition leads to. Hopefully, uh, this guy, Blake Brandell, right? Hopefully he can yeah. step up and, um, be a much better run blocker than we saw out of, uh, Reisner and, and hold his own in the past game too. So that's something to look forward to this year. And I think he's not equally as good at, at pass blocking, but he's pretty good. I keep talking about the independent hands where he can, if it, one gets chopped, he's got the other and he just brings it right back. So he's not like, you know, our right guard, which is, you know, you just trying to mirror the guy with both hands all the time. And if he gets chopped it and you know, he's done, but uh, I think both of them got, uh, Reisner and him got very good awareness when it comes like, you know, you hear about that on Madden, but you know, they, they, they know when a guy's coming and I, and I feel pretty good about it. Now the, the, uh, big, the big thing everybody's watching out of camp, uh, is the quarterback competition. And how do you feel like that is going right now? So I rely on the beat reporters to, really tell me what they're seeing. I trust their opinions. Um, and a lot of them are, are in lockstep with each other. They thought that Sam Darnold showed a lot of poise and um, mastering of the offense throughout the spring and the early summer. Now, he did have his worst practice yesterday. Um, and he threw some picks through an interception in the red zone period to Harrison Smith. And conversely to that, Justin or JJ McCarthy had his best practice the same day that Sam Darnold had his worst practice. So there's going to be a lot of people reacting to that and wondering if JJ's, uh, you know, maybe the better quarterback for the job. But I'm going to take it one day at a, at a time here, and uh, let's let's see how they react now that the pads come on tomorrow and we get some more 11 on 11 periods. Um, but honestly, I think that the Vikings. Are, are going to be just fine with either guy running the show. I, I trust KOC to make that determination. Um, when JJ is ready, he will play. And if he is uh, sitting the entire year because Sam's having a good year and, and serving as that, um, that quarterback to let JJ sit for an entire year, then that's fine too. But, I mean, I'm not worried yet. Um, I think – Everything coming out of camp has has signs for optimism regarding that quarterback room so far. What are your thoughts? Well, they're both looking pretty decent with nobody rushing them. Correct. Or no one trying to touch them because they got red jerseys on. So <laughs> I get the biggest kick out of uh, people tweeting out a video going, look at that dime he threw. Yeah, he would have been sacked because the, the guy was right there. He just, he just let him throw the ball. So there's, you know, it's like, yeah, sure, they're looking great. I think I was an article out, and I did a video on it about how Sam Dartle shines in shorts. And I'm like, yeah, he's got all the athletic ability, and you're right. Um, this is a, a new game, a new team. Uh, can he go from six and a half yards per attempt when Nick Mullins is eight in his career to getting to where Kirk Cousins was over seven, seven and a half, somewhere in there that uh, he could – you know, they, they gave Kirk Cousins crap about being captain check down. I mean, six and a half is pretty miserable. And, you know, 59 completion percentage, which might have been good in the 80s, but now not so much. You know, I, you know, I, but I think he's got all the physical tools. I think he's smart enough. I, I think he's got an overseeing ghost. Uh, I don't know if he still sees ghosts. I don't think he does. But, um, you know, I, I think it, I, I think more so now, like, uh, that 40% chance J.J. McCarthy starts when I thought it was 10, you know, before before camp started. And I, I feel I feel pretty good about that. Uh, he's carrying himself well. You could see people gravitating him in the practice. You don't see anybody wanting to interview with Sam Darnold, right? You don't see that. You don't see play, you know, Sam Darnold and Justin Jefferson walking arm arm in arm across the across the football field talking about who should who gets the name jj you know it's like 
it's almost like a foregone conclusion that J.J. McCarthy's our future leader of the team, and I'm starting to feel more and more like that, that it may happen this year when earlier on in the offseason I thought, nah, it sounds like Sam Darnold's going to play the whole year if he does you know, if he does good, if like he plays all right. How would you feel about that? Uh, in lockstep with you, I'd say I'm probably 25% now. J.J. could be that starter week one when at first I thought, it was much lower than that, like you said, ten percent, five percent, somewhere in there. But uh, I mean, it's it's probably as good as it could have been so far for JJ McCarthy to to be grasping the things that he's grasping right now. All the rhetoric about him um, with his mechanics are improving. Um, yeah, he doesn't look like a train wreck out there without a pass rush, which is an important step. Although, in, <laughs> like you would expect that, but it is important. Um, and, he did have a pick though. When when did yeah. that happen? You said he had a great day and Sam Darnold didn't. But when mm-hmm. was the pick? Was it the, wasn't it the same day or was that a different yeah. day? No, it was the same day that happened yesterday. That was a pick by Theo, uh, Theo Jackson, Jackson yeah. and that was uh, I saw the play on Twitter. It was a great pick by Theo Jackson, and um, it looked like uh, I think it was then a eleven on elevens. I believe that happened. Um, yeah, but what I would say is rush. don't sweat the picks. It's going to happen. Uh, he he needs. I to think learn last year. I think I think it was two years ago. Like Kirk Cousins had like two or three in the first practice, mm-hmm. and then he went on to have his best year ever. Yeah, you know, this is the like, time to yeah. throw interceptions. <laughs> what can you get away with? Uh, yeah, you're working you're, on timing, yeah. and that was an in cutting route in the middle of the field. You're working on the timing there. He was, the uh, from what I heard, he was late on that throw. Um, but one more thing about Sam Darnold, and I trust uh, the opinion of Judd Zolgad is that he's the deep stuff from Darnold right now looks beautiful. He's thrown a few of those deep bombs and they're dropped right in the bucket for Justin and for Addison. We've seen a couple, but the intermediate stuff has been pretty ugly from Darnold. So I don't know if it's a timing thing or if he's always kind of struggled with intermediate passing, but that's a huge thing for KOC's offense. A lot of stuff over the middle. So I'm hoping that Sam Darnold can clean that up or we might see uh, then make the switch to JJ sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'm feeling. Yeah, I'm feeling the same way. I mean, you know, I mean, when I, when I went to, it's funny when I did a video on Sam Darnold. Um, I was not a fan of bringing in anybody to be a bridge. I was like, we already got one. His name's Nick Mullins. He threw for 400 yards, and he was pressing because we our defense couldn't stop anybody. They disappeared at the end of the season. So I wasn't a big fan of it. And then I go, okay, I'm going to go look at his, you know, look at video of him in college. And I'm like, I look at his highlight reel and it's like one of his highlights was a guy he underthrew that had to come back to the ball and the guy and the guy got tackled right away. And then there were other highlights was um, his receivers mossing people because he underthrew it or, you know, he sure he threw it, you know, threw it to a guy's, you know, he's tight coverage, but his receiver made the play more than he made the play. And I'm like, God, is this a guy? Is this a guy that got drafted third overall? I don't like. Was it? Were we? Was the team desperate that year? Um, but I do look at him um, in practice. He looks like he can throw. He's mo- and I saw I seen him running, you know, in in football games. He's mobile, um, almost like a Josh Allen, but not as big, not as you know, tough a runner. But he's got that mobility. So I like it in, in, you know, he's got, a, he's a taller, you know, he's got plenty of arm. Uh, again, it's, you know, he's been beat up like a lot and he's thrown a lot of picks and, you know, hopefully he's not, what I don't want is impressing thinking, you know, it sucks that I look over your shoulder every, every year, but uh, hopefully he's used to it by now because it's happened quite a bit. Um, so it's almost like I, if I want, JJ McCarthy to take over week one and then we don't have to worry about it. Nobody's looking over their shoulder. Uh, but if Sam Darnold starts and he plays the whole season and keeps JJ McCarthy on the bench and we win a Super Bowl, uh, Sam Darnold extension next year. I'm like, that's the kind of thing I root for our guys to do good, not to do crappy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it should be. Yeah. I'm so I I'm, Again, in lockstep with you, I think yeah. that um, Sam Darnold has the capability to, if everything goes correctly, to get this team to the playoffs. 
Um, but this team also has the capability to win six games and underachieve this year. So either way, we're going to be rooting our guys on and we just want to see good football. And I trust the, the biggest thing that I keep coming back to is I trust Kevin O'Connell as the head football coach of this team. And I trust him as the quarterback uh, quarterback development guy. You know what I mean? I trust him to do the best job. And if JJ ultimately fails, I think it's going to be on JJ because he wasn't good enough. And that's all you can ask for, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want your quarterback to fail because you don't have the guys around him or because your head coach doesn't know what he's doing to progress your, your new franchise quarterback that you took in the top 10 for the first time in franchise history. If he's going to fail, it's because he's not good enough. Um, and now we're going to get to sit back and see. Yeah. And one of the things about when we signed them, I think everybody was, uh, you know, breathing easier after we drafted Dallas Turner because if JJ McCarthy doesn't hit we got Dallas Turner and that's and that's the way I felt about it now you mentioned playoffs so there was a team in our division that made the playoffs and that was the Green Bay Packers I actually met a Brazilian fan I go why are you a Green Bay Packer well they played in Brazil once I'm like all right okay so they just he just signed the big cheese, the big contract. Tell us about that contract, Skoldock. Yeah, man. So <laughs> I've never seen someone get paid this much money based on half a season. My God. So let's let's break it down like this. First of all, everyone praises the Packers for the way that they raise up their quarterbacks, right? Uh Aaron Rodgers sat for years behind Favre. This guy sits for years behind Aaron Rodgers. Um I personally, and they've gotten extremely lucky. They've hit on three straight franchise quarterbacks. But personally, I don't think that's good business to waste the entire rookie contract and then get a half a year out of him and then have to pay him the highest uh, graded contract for quarterbacks in the National Football League. I mean, that just makes it tougher on yourself to get back to the Super Bowl. So personally, this is just my opinion. I think that he's a good quarterback. I don't think he belongs anywhere near being paid top eight quarterback money. I don't think he's that guy. I think Jordan Love probably is your 10th to 15th best quarterback when it's all said and done. And we're going to, you know, I may eat these words after next year, but I think he's got a great offensive coach an offensive uh, coordinator in Mike LaFour. And, uh, I, I think that they hit on some young weapons with their wide receiver core. Uh, Jaden Reed is great. Um, Christian Watson, when he can be on the field, is dangerous with his speed. But at the end of the day, I think that this contract has the potential to be one of the worst contracts in the NFL in the modern day. Uh, I mean, you look back to the Albert Hainsworth contract. That's the one that pops into my mind as one of the worst contracts ever signed. Um, you're signing Jordan Love based on an eight-game sample size last year where he was pretty damn good at the end of the year, and then he spanked the Cowboys in Dallas in the playoffs. Um, but then in, when the crunch time against San Francisco, he made a very poor decision, very poor throw, and lost that game for the Packers. And the first half of that season last year was not great for Jordan Love. Um, a lot of my Packer Rooting friends seem to believe that he is the guy that we saw in the last eight games of last year, but I'm not so sure, honestly. I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, to the Packers' credit, they only gave him a four-year deal versus a longer-term deal, and the guaranteed money wasn't as high as some of the other quarterbacks uh, that are out there. But with that said, this is essentially a four-year, almost fully guaranteed contract, and the guy's going to have to be good for them to accomplish their goals. And, of course, on this side of the river, we're going to hope that he's not good. So what do you think? Well, and going into the season, they had the tightest salary issues, if I'm not mistaken. Like, they were broken even, Mm -hmm. and everybody else was positive. And then, then no, you have to sign your quarterback. You're just not in that situation where you have money coming. Like, with us, if we would have re-signed Kirk, we knew – 2025 we were going to have a lot of money available to us so but they don't but they knew going into this that they were going to be pretty tight 
Um, so, you know, I, I haven't looked at it enough to maybe there's room coming out, people coming off a of room coming up and people coming off contracts. And now this day and age, it seems like you really got to roll the dice uh, and hopefully, hopefully you win. And I think that's why they did it. I think um, they're confident of, you know, who they are as development, a developmental franchise, you know, when they, you know, how they develop players. And I think, they, I think they're just, maybe, uh, maybe it's a pride thing. Like, Hey, we, we, we hit it twice. We can do it again three times. But I, I think uh, he does have limitations. Uh, I think accuracy was an issue at times. Um, you know, he was off on the deep ball quite a bit in like the first game we played with him. And uh, again, I think he's got the talent. I think he's a good, a good person, a good kid. I think, I think he's the type of guy you want in the locker room. I think, you know, and to sign 55 million that, and you're going to spend the next four years in green Bay of all places. I think, you know, he's, he's okay with that. You know, like he's okay to be, Hey, there's a history here. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the next guy. And that, it says something, it says something um, that he, he, he's going to own that town. Um, you know, you know, I, all the power to him. I, I don't think, you know, Detroit signed their guy for big money. So here we are, the bears and the Vikings with the two, with the two guy, you know, the two quarterbacks that didn't, aren't costing much money. So our future, I think looks brighter. Uh, I think the, I think the uh, Bears' future looks brighter. Uh, you know, they got a stadium coming, so I think you know. I I think I think the I think right now it's anybody's ball game. I think if our quarterback and let, let's end on that. Our I think our I think the situation we have right now, anybody could win the division. I feel that way. Bears could come out with the, all the young talent they brought up. All we need is our quarterback to play pretty decent. And I think we could be right there. And then, you know, the Packers and Lions made the playoffs last year. But I don't think there's any difference in talent. In fact, I feel like we got better talent in a lot of places. But how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think that I think that the Vikings are the Vegas favorite to finish fourth in division and for good reason, most likely. So I won't be surprised. Yeah, the quarterback, they're looking at that. But also, I mean, look, we talked about our cornerback um, situation right now as well, which could make it tough for the defense. Um, and you look at just – you look at the Lions roster and the Packers roster, they they are better rosters right now top to bottom in terms of just having depth and having every position filled. Um, but I don't think the Vikings are far behind by any means. Um, so – I think that next year it's going to be completely wide open um, with the resources that the Vikings have to fill these holes uh, with a ton of cap space coming up. And uh, like you said, the Packers and the Lions are going to be much more strapped for cash and another year older, they're going to lose some free agents. Um, So really it comes down to, like you said, the Bears and the Vikings on these rookie quarterback scales can they build up the roster like San Francisco did with Brock Purdy to build a contender and beat these quarterbacks? And at the end of the day, you know, it's the Packers are going to have to have Jordan Love be that guy who elevates the team to to play against rosters like Chicago and, and the Vikings are building. Um, so it'll it'll be fun to I think that this year and the next year we could see a division with without a losing record, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a very good division. So let me ask you this. How was it having your first show named after you? Was it everything you hoped it would be? <laughs> Dude, it's awesome just to have the platform to come here and talk Vikings with you. Um, the, the team that I love, the team that I, that I bleed for uh, ever since they broke my heart in, 2009 um you know i've I've been watching them all the way back from 98 when i first got into the vikings and fast forward to now i'm 33 years old uh get to practice medicine do what i love as a foot and ankle doctor and then when i'm not in the or to be able to come on here and just chat vikings it's makes me happy man thank you very much for having me oh man the pleasure's all mine i've been 
you know, wanting something like this to happen. Uh, and, it, and the, you were the first on my mind when I did it. So, Hey, I appreciate you. Appreciate you spending some time on my channel and I hopefully have you on whenever you're, whenever you want to do a show, man, it's, it's been uh, my pleasure. And, uh, I don't know. Skull Vikes. Skull, baby. Let's go.